maybe let me start with you, Uwe. You are, I mentioned Ankle, the company you belong. You are a company which submitted and got a 1.5 trajectory validated by SBTI. So I would say you know your targets, you know uh, what to do. Uh, maybe you're doing it, but as I was saying, when we look at it globally, we are not that yet there yet. What is slowing us down? Well, reflecting a bit, uh, we are ahead of some, but I think we're still learning and we're still learning a lot. And reflecting on the last discussion, maybe let's start with one, making it personal and tangible. And in 1986, a long time ago, uh, one of Germany's magazines had the Cologne Cathedral, I'm based in Cologne, sitting in the middle of water saying climate change, rescue themselves who can. So imagine here, beautiful view, the Eiffel Tower in the water. I mean, for me, that made it very personal. This is an existential threat. So first point, making it personal. Second point is breaking it down. It's such a huge challenge and that you can easily say, well, I can't do anything about it, and hopefully it's very far away. At that point, 1986, 2050 was very far away. And so the Science-Based Targets Initiative, I think, was another important step in this, in helping people to break it down and also to give some assurance that we're on the right track, because it's such a tremendous challenge. If you can't see any progress, if you can't track whether you're on the right track, you feel lost and you lose motivation. So I think that's the first part. Um, then we touched on data. Henkel has been doing life cycle assessments for decades. At some point in the 80s we started. But it's a huge challenge even for a company with this experience. We have thousands and thousands of suppliers and even more thousands of different raw materials. So first of all we tried to model the carbon footprint based on the different raw materials we sourced. That was quite an effort. But then, if you want to show progress to the science-based targets initiative, and we have a scope three target for our value chain, for our raw materials and packaging materials, we need to know what's happening with those raw materials. So now we have around 25% of the footprint actually covered with primary data from our suppliers, thousands of data sets coming from our suppliers. And we have asked many more who are lost, who don't know how to measure yet, uh, who are challenged with the standards, who will deliver numbers which don't fit. So we need to provide more clarity on that. We need to train our suppliers. And we also need to align on the standards. One of our very well-trained or skilled suppliers came back to us and said, which of these nine numbers do you want for the footprint of the raw material, depending on how you interpret the rules. So there we need to make progress. And then, ultimately, it's not just about data, and that's probably our biggest challenge. It's about the system. I mean, we are sourcing energy, and only if we have more renewable energy, we can defossilize all the energy use along the value chain, both upstream and downstream. And I don't know what it's like in France. I imagine it's not that much easier than in Germany. We really struggle to install new wind turbines, solar cells, etc. Um, we then need to de defossilize our materials with our suppliers. They need to change production processes. They need to innovate. Here today, we've seen some very engaged, committed, innovators driving their ideas. So we need more of those ideas. We need to scale them up. We need to bring them into the value chains, and then we need to be able to account for the progress. And last but not least, I think we need all consumers to take a part in it and to understand what it means for them and how to contribute themselves for two reasons. On the one hand, most consumers have an influence, not just at the point of sale, but they're also voting, they're banking, they're taking decisions in their own professional lives. And so if you have an idea of what you can do, you will take that learning into the value chain. And consumers do have a lot of influence, not just by what they buy, but also by how they use it. So all of us hopefully take showers, maybe not every day, but um, at least every second day, I would assume. And in Germany, one minute of showering on average is about the same carbon footprint as one kilometer driven with a conventional car. So you can imagine if you shower a little shorter, temperature doesn't make that much of a difference, but if you shower a little shorter, a little faster, you can save a tremendous amount of energy. So that shows we can develop a cold water shower gel, but you'll still feel cold. So it's up to you to take a little shorter showers. So that's some of the levers we need to work on. And ultimately, we need to make it desirable. So the cold shower is not desirable, but maybe it's desirable to get out quickly, do something fun. I mean, some days it's fun under the shower. Some days you just want to get on with your life. Thank you. You dressed quite a long list, indeed, of things that need to change to evolve and accelerate. Uh, Adrian, you represent a financial institution. I was mentioning money in the previous uh, discussion here. 
what role for financial institution, how can you actively trigger the decarbonation path we need? Um, yeah, maybe le let me start with the positive um, aspect of, uh, um, particularly, uh, you know, the uh, SBTI framework that we have uh, touched best uh, about. Um, you know, before um, I was a chief sustainability officer, I worked like for 10 years as a portfolio manager, standard portfolio managers, and I was like seen as a, you know, very serious and very credible person because I was like dealing on numbers every day on Bloomberg screen. And once I started working on sustainable finance, suddenly I became like an irrational person talking about weird concepts. So the great thing with the SBTI framework is that it makes us look credible and very serious again. Uh, so that's first a, a, you know, a very uh, positive uh, effect. Indeed, you know, the framework, and I think Ma McKenna uh, said it uh, very clearly, um, it's very useful because it's science-based, uh, because it's comparable, uh, because also it's sectoral-specific. Uh, and of course, it's a dynamic approach. Um, so you know, other, uh, so we were one of the first uh, four first financial institutions in the world to adopt, uh, to have our uh, trajectory um, validated by the science-based target, and we uh, worked also on the methodology uh, before. So maybe uh, the experience that I, I can share is that it definitely borders a lot of rigor in terms of data collection. So Charlotte, uh, you know, talked a lot about that. Um, so for example. Uh, in a couple of years, we increase from 10% to like 90% the uh, greenhouse gases emission data um, in terms of a mortgage portfolio. Uh, so that was a, a huge increase. Um, it also creates a lot of expertise in our teams um, because, you know, they worked a lot on these uh, methodological aspects. And you were talking about investment. We do invest a lot of resources so that they get up to speed in terms of the different uh, uh, methodology. Um, and of course, um, you, you also touched based on that uh, previously, it has a strong governance importance um, because it's a commitment that is taken at the company level and it's definitely one of the, one of the key KPI in terms of the strategy that we're following. Thank you, Adrian. Andrew, looking at you, you work on the solution side uh, with Pure. Uh, you develop and implement solutions to reduce or compensate uh, emission, especially in the scope three upstream uh, of a lot of companies. The question I would have for you is a question around the solutions. We often hear on one side that a lot of solutions are already there. At the same time, we are missing or lacking solutions. What's your perspective? Do we have what it needs? Yes and no. Exactly the opposites. Um, no, it's a very fair question. So 24% of emissions roughly come from the flag sector, the forestry, land use, and agriculture sector. When we look historically, this has been one of the hardest sectors to tackle. And very fortunately, in creating an avalanche of interest in the space, the science-based target initiative with the World Resources Institute released in companion the flag guidance, the forestry, land use, and agriculture guidance, and the land sector guidance for the GHG protocol. And these two documents in combination have created an enhanced focus on addressing scope three missions through the use of nature-based solutions and addressing nature-based problems that are affecting our climate. Now, fundamentally, if you look at the other, let's say 75% of emission, many of those sectors have core actors that you can look at to address change. Very powerful actors that have materially significant influences on GHG emissions globally. When you look at the land sector, you're talking about billions of individual farmers that have to make individual decisions to change their practices if we're going to approach that 24%. But we need that 24%. Do we have solutions for those farmers? Absolutely. Do we have the incentives for those farmers? That's where it gets a bit more complicated. And when we talk about the incentives for farmers, that is a combination of features of what was mentioned earlier. Do we have the right government incentives? Do we have the right, right government policies? With the SBT now, we have much more of a push from the corporate sector for their supply chains to improve. And so there is more incentive there. But the question I would ask is, is there a willingness to pay? So the physical solutions related to regenerative agriculture, agroforestry, landscape restoration, those aspects of addressing scope three in corporates, which can represent 70 to 80% of a corporate's footprint, depending on their, if they're in the food and beverage industry or fashion industry, those physical and technical solutions are there. The question is, are the right structures and the right incentives present to allow us to have that step change and that momentum that we want to create? And I would say today, there's still work to do. The science-based target has been a material shift, as I mentioned, the corporate sector. 
I would argue that the work being done in the corporate sector for inventory accounting, which has been a big shift in how we think about nature-based solutions, needs to be communicated very strongly with governments because governments also have their nationally uh, determined contributions. And today, we're seeing that there could be more conversation to foster the right synergies between what corporates are trying to do and the inventory accounting approaches there and what governments are trying to do to incentivize action against their own nationally determined contributions. So there's absolutely solutions, but the context has to evolve and the context has to improve if we're going to find the momentum on change that we need to see. To make this context evolve, how could we get faster? I was this morning in a session where basically it started with let's first think for whom we vote because in the end we have the government, most of us, we elected. So uh, should the change start here? Is it corporate that should be more pushy and aggressive with government? Where would you see the change come? I would say there's a way to vote for policy. There's also a way to vote with your dollars. And I would actually say, you know, it came up earlier that sustainability is not free. If you are a smallholder farmer who produces cocoa or coffee or a row crop or what have you, you have a commodity coming from your farm. When you have a company asking you to now produce another commodity, carbon on your farm, shouldn't we also be saying to that farmer, oh, and associated with that, you're going to get material economic benefits? That will create significant interest. But globally, we all as consumers, we all as brands, we all as actors have to be willing to pay more if we feel that the true cost of environment needs to be considered. We all emotionally know that, we all ideologically know that, but we will have to push to say, look, this isn't free. We're asking actors to make change. That change can be costly, and it's creating an asset that a company will value or a government will value, shouldn't the farmer also be able to benefit from that? And these are conversations that are materially evolving, but that we really have to have a focus on. Thanks. My next question is actually for the three of you and also to get your perspective. We have been discussing with Charlotte and McKenna about the importance of getting the data. We have been talking about getting the money. We have been talking about evolving the policy. Uh, this could seem incremental to some extent and then raise the question, do we have time to go step by step? Uh, from your perspective, are there other solutions, more disruptive solution that at some point could help us really trigger the step change, uh, th th just tapping in what you can see uh, in public discussions, in newspaper and so on. For finance, there is the question around should we stop financing some sectors. Uh, for consumer goods companies, there are questions, should we radically evolve the mix of the products uh, we sell? So if we really could trigger some radical change, what would it be, what could it be, or what, what would you like it to be, acknowledging that then uh, it might be a difficult path? Maybe Adrienne. Um, yeah, um, it's definitely maybe two big changes uh, as part of, you know, as a, as a banker. The first one is definitely a cultural change. Um, you know, like the work of a, of a banker has definitely standardized a lot over the past 20 years with like digitalization and also with standardization of financial products. The great thing with sustainability is that it actually brings totally changes the way the banker needs to, cha to, to think and to approach his client between, because he needs to be specialized again. He needs to understand the business plan of, the, uh, of, the, of, of his clients and you know, what are the different changes in the sectors, like you know, what are the new sustainable uh, materials for like, the construction sector. So it's coming from like, a generalist to a more specialist people and it's definitely a cultural change and a lot also uh, of training uh, for the banker. Maybe the the second big change, and you uh, kind of said it, is that we need to realize indeed that we cannot have it all and that we need to make, um, you know, we have uh, as a banker, our role is like to manage our resources and our capital. Um, so we need to make um, strong decisions in order that we use this capital, which is very precious and very rare, in order to direct it to the actors that 
have taken a decision and transition decision that are aligned with the Paris uh, Agreement. So we have, for example, in 2021, um, we have um, uh, published a policy on oil and gas, and we were one of the first uh, actors to actually announce that we were going to stop to finance uh, oil and gas uh, uh, industry um, by 2030 for all the actors that are not aligned uh, with the Paris Agreement, that are not you know, SBTI approved. So for the moment, there aren't any actors of the oil and gas industry that are SBTI approved. But if there were some, of course, we would be very happy to finance them. It's not a question of, you know, we stop financing. It's just a question of we choose the right actors in the sectors. Okay. Maybe you will. Well, um, if we talk about radical change and step change, I think let's rather think about a radical step change in implementation. I think there are so many ideas out there, so many innovations out there, so much we can do. And I've been in this for more than 25 years, and I described that I saw the cathedral even earlier in the water. I think it's time to act, and what does it take? And I think one is to involve people, to move out of the niche, but into the breadth of society. And more than 10 years ago, we decided to start a sustainability ambassador program, train all of our employees, and also ask our employees to go out, for example, to primary schools and talk about little kids, third and fourth grade, about sustainability in the households, not our products, but if you have kids, you know, they like to wear their laundry only once and put it in the basket because it's way easier than sorting it back. It's a bit of a waste. So it's a win for you as a parent and a win for the environment. Taking shorter showers is also good for your household energy and water bill. So starting there early and at the same time, those little kids will be ambassadors. They'll ask you, why are you driving this big car or small car or turn off the engine? Why aren't we taking the train? So taking it into the society, taking it into the younger generations. Then the other challenge I think we have is that people are looking at individual solutions and presenting it as the one and only important thing. But we need to really move into an ecosystems thinking. We want to insulate houses, that means we need craftsmen. We want to install heat pumps, we need to train people to how to install and set up heat pumps. If we want to have the right products, we need the right raw material suppliers, we need to qualify with the right data. And if we want to build wind farms, we really need to make sure that there's um, cables to really transmit the electricity, another challenge we have in Germany, but we also need it in Europe, transmitting, for example, solar electricity from Spain, where we just invested into a virtual power purchasing agreement, to France, but then also to Germany and further on. So really thinking about the whole system, because one solution alone won't solve it. And ultimately, we need to keep up the spirit of innovation and make it desirable. We've seen lots of desirable solutions here that are attractive, that feel like the future, a positive, desirable future. We can do that with our products, but we can also do it in personal lives. Uh, you could call it life hacks, things that are good for climate, but also are fun, things that make things easier and share those to really create more of a movement and not wait for change tomorrow, but to live rather change today. Andrew, your turn. Perfect, so I, I don't want to sound too much like a broken record on, on the you know, willingness to pay, but I do think and have thought for a long time that true cost accounting is really you know, a decision-making framework that could allow us to evaluate ourselves and our performance in a new way. Um, we talk about the SBT and the data that that provides us and the strategy we can have behind that. We talk about other evolving frameworks and data is always at the core of that. We use that data to create choices, but we don't get evaluated based on that data in many cases. And so from a political perspective, you said, how do we influence policy from a corporate perspective? Should we not judge ourselves at the national level that GDP is maybe one measure when we should be looking at other measures? When we look at the corporate level, we're seeing the incorporation of carbon commitments and carbon performance uh, affecting the compensation in IFRS models for CEOs. You know, these are some of the steps that when we're held accountable for the use of this data and the direction that this data is moving in, I think it forces decision making and, and a level of vulnerability that forces decision making in a faster and stepwise way. Um, so I think that would be a, if I had to do something a bit more disruptive, that would probably be it. Thank you. Maybe one last question again for the three of you and for the audience. If you want each of us to act a bit differently tomorrow when it comes to the role we can play on decarbonation, what advice would you bring to the room? Andre, we'll start with you that time. Okay, okay no time to think. Um, <laughs> If we were to be serious about what we want to do, um, 
we have costs, marginal cost mitigation curves, right? We know the solutions, and that was the initial question, is that we have an understanding of what those solutions are. To get serious about it, we need certain levels of flexibility, and we've, you know, we've talked about the SBT, et cetera. We need some adjustments to some of these frameworks to, affect, to address realities and flexibility for action today. And we need those actors that receive that flexibility to have the willingness to act and to step forward. Again, context is important. I think the solutions are there, but we do need to mature that context. And so I would focus on the interlinkages between your role, your responsibilities, how it affects and touches and finds synergies with other actors that are accomplishing or seeking to accomplish the exact same goals. Don't look at it as two scopes of work. Say, who are my friends, who are my partners? What are we all collectively trying to achieve? And how do we find synergies between organizations? Because otherwise, you have a much higher cost to achieve the same goal. Let's look for those efficiencies. Thank you. Ul. Well, so I would say you describe the how, then maybe I describe the context. So both in your personal as well as in your professional lives, try to understand the footprint of you personally or your organization, find out the biggest levers, and then break it down into actionable goals, find the right approach, what makes sense economically as well as from a climate perspective, and then celebrate the wins in your business with your friends to build confidence that we can take the, tackle the more challenging steps that are ahead of us. Yeah, I think uh, it, it's a difficult uh, also time because we need now to definitely, you know, reconcile all our um, carbon and climate ambitions with uh, the financial goal. And, and, and actually, you said it rightly, uh, you know, we need to recognize how much it costs. So um, maybe to give you also an example of um, in terms of, you know, something that uh, um, uh, it's probably close to all of you. Um, in terms of the uh, goal that we have set in our mortgage portfolio, we have set up a goal of like nearly decrease of like greenhouse gas emission of nearly 50% by 2030. What does it mean concretely in terms of the mortgage that you're going to ask us tomorrow? It means basically that we're going to stop financing all, you know, lower energy efficient housing, which is like uh, below everything that is below the letter of D, you know, in the French regulation of the diagnosis of performance. Uh, you know, most of the uh, housing right now are like E or F or even some uh, some of the housing are, are uh, G. Um, and also, we need to uh, massively, uh, you know, give loans in terms of renovation. So that's uh, absolutely big, big change in terms of, you know, the way we set up our commercial goals, but also the way, you know, the mortgage industry is working, the real estate industry is working, the construction industry is working. So that's definitely um, collectively only and also with the help of their uh, policies and, and regulators uh, that we can uh, tackle those challenges.